next speaker will be me, and I will speak about uh, pre-construction risk assessment and post-construction on-site surveys and mitigation for bird wind turbine interactions. And I will keep my own time so I can talk for as long as I want. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you all very much for participating in this. As I said, I think this is a really important topic, and I'm, I'm glad we have a chance to, uh, to talk about it. So I'm going to focus today on three primary areas of interest. Some of this will repeat what some of my colleagues have said before, but that's okay. I'm only going to repeat the most important things. And so you will hear them several times. I will focus on pre-construction risk assessment, post-construction surveys, and mitigation. So pre-construction surveys generally focus on counting the number of individuals present. Um, for birds, we use point counts or transects. For bats, we use acoustic surveys. And we almost always focus on live animals. This is something that Jill mentioned in her talk. Uh, but it, it becomes a little bit of a problem because when we do post-construction surveys, we always count dead animals. And it's very hard to compare one versus the other. And in fact, we know that there is weak correspondence between the two. It's very difficult to make that comparison. And what that means is the way we do pre-construction surveys doesn't tell us a lot about the impacts, and that's that's a problem sometimes. So in the USA, I think we have a somewhat similar process to Spain for pre-construction assessment. It's a three-part process. The first is an, a, what we call a desk study. We don't go to the field at all. We can, we, we look at, uh, site, we look at literature, things like that. Uh, the second one is a site-specific evaluation. It's actually on site, but it tends to be very general. And then the third is actually risk assessment, which is on site and quantitative. And I'm going to talk briefly about each of these. The preliminary assessment, I said it's a desk study. You can use things like museum specimens, satellite imagery. This is us right where we are. But uh, you can use museum specimens, satellite imagery, things like that, literature reports to assess what is happening at a site. That is a very high level assessment, but it's one that can really tell us quite a bit potentially. Things like migratory corridors are really are easier to detect that way than almost any other technique. Once a, a, a desk study has been conducted, if the, if the site meets certain standards, then there can be a site-specific evaluation that's a more in detailed uh, assessment. It involves a visit. It involves confirmation of species presence, confirmation of habitat features, confirmation of habitat, for instance, places that bats hibernate or wetlands that might be used by a rare species. This, this uh, site-specific evaluation does not count the number of individuals. That comes at the next step, typically. And that's what, what we call a risk assessment. Um, Risk assessment often uses technologies like radar, capture and tracking, acoustic surveys, 
field techniques like point counts, transects, behavioral observations, uh, migration count sites, or risk modeling. So on the right, we have a, a monitoring setup, a, a remote monitoring setup that's one that was used in Alaska. On the bottom right, we have a, a risk map that was produced by, by my research team. This was a risk map for golden eagles. You can do this type of thing, pre-construction, and get an idea of where risk might be. Um, if you're doing pre-construction surveys, at least in the U.S., it, you should always estimate detection rates. In the USA, it's really, really rare to estimate detection rates for pre-construction surveys. Um, this risk assessment is useful because it's kind of the final step in the process for a site assessment, but it also can guide mitigation, as I, I think uh, some of my colleagues have alluded to. Post-construction surveys to date almost exclusively focus on counting dead things, right? It would be really nice if, if people came in and counted, did pre-construction surveys for live birds and also did pre-construction surveys for dead birds. I think it happens some of the time for a few species, but for many species, it really doesn't. If you're counting fatalities, you have to estimate detection rates. And that's something I'm gonna to return to a couple of times. It's something that we, we in the USA, we do a lot of when we count fatalities. Uh, we, we don't necessarily stress it enough. Detection rates have two parts, the efficiency with, with which uh, you can search and also the, the rates at which uh, carcasses are removed by scavengers. Um, again, I've mentioned, Jill mentioned this, and I've mentioned it before, fatalities are never estimated pre-construction, and the searching is rarely standardized across fate facilities. It might seem really stupid to count fatalities pre-construction, right? And that's what I used to think. But there are a couple of environmental consulting firms in the USA who go out to a wind facility when they find dead birds and they say, oh, that's just background mortality. It would have happened anyway. And if there's no data to refute that, then they win that argument. And so it really is important to make sure that you know what what data are going to be collected and you can actually collect them in a way that makes for useful comparison. Uh, when you're searching for fatalities, uh, you can either use humans or you can use dogs. I think we had a message from, uh, from Ohad in Israel who pointed out that in Israel it's required to use dogs. Dogs are way, way better than people at this. So people find between six and 30% of small animals and 50 to 90% of large animals. Dogs can find almost 100% of the small animals and very close to 100% with, with larger animals. Dogs are much, much better than people. You do need dogs that are well-trained but there are more and more people and companies that are doing this. And it might be something that would be useful to develop here in Kazakhstan. One of the really important things about post-construction surveys is that you need a robust experimental design. And I wanna talk about this a little bit because it's important. You have to define your search area, your season and your interval. As I've said, you have to discuss look at detection rates. Two other things that you want to be doing, but that I'm not going to talk about, you have to identify species accurately. For some things, that's easy. Griffin vultures are griffin vultures. There's nothing else in Europe that looks like a griffin vulture. But in Kazakhstan, there's griffin vultures and Himalayan griffins. And unless you're experienced, they might look similar. Same thing is true for many passerines. It can be difficult to tell them apart. The other part of it is that we really need to be thinking about population level consequences. 
I can give a completely different talk about population level consequences. Um, we don't do it enough. In fact, we almost don't do it at all in the USA or in Europe, but it's a really, really important thing. I mentioned that we need to define the search area. So there's a wind turbine. And the first thing you need to decide if you're going to search for dead animals, the first thing you need to do is decide how big your search area is going to be, right? And that seems really obvious, but what you need to think about is what is the what we call the fall distribution or the fall distance. So this is a plot showing data for eagle carcasses. And you can see that there's a peak somewhere between 20 and 50 meters from the from the pole in the center, but there can be turbines out to 100 meters. In fact, there can be, tur there, excuse me, there can be fatalities out to 100 meters, sometimes even farther than 100 meters. And what that means for eagles is that some of them are getting pushed a long way, others are getting hit, and they walk a little way, and then they die. You need to be able to account for this when you're searching. Same thing is true for, for small birds, big birds, and bats. These plots go out to 170 meters, so you can sometimes find animals, certainly 120, often up to 150 or 170 meters from that monopole. You need to define that search area based on what your target is, and that's all part of the experimental design. The same thing is true for the season of the year. There's a great deal of variation in when things are killed by season of the year. This plot over here shows bats, and this plot goes from about December to November, so it's about 12 months. Most of the fatalities are in late summer and, and early fall, right? If you want to find bats, you don't want to search over at this time of the year. Um, I can tell you also in the USA that there have been people who have done, in, in the USA, we do surveys for golden eagles sometimes. And I know of some wind facilities where the surveys, where there were surveys to count migrating golden eagles. And they did the surveys in August, September, and October, which is great. You're going to count lots of broad-winged hawks. Eagles don't migrate until November or December. And so they found no eagles. And they said there was no risk, but there were actually quite a few eagles that migrated by this site. Same thing is true for other species. These are months of, of the year, and so birds can peak in the summer, but bats may be later in the year. But different bird species peak at, at different times of the year, and different bat species peak at different times of the year. And so you need to be thinking about that when you're designing your surveys. And then the other part of it is def defining your search interval. Um, these are plots from a paper showing carcass persistence over just a 24-hour period. And what you can see is the smaller the carcass, the less likely it is to persist for 24 hours. If you have, uh, you know, in the USA, we almost never do surveys every day. In fact, a lot of the surveys we do are at 30-day intervals. So at 30-day intervals, you're going to lose most of your small carcasses. You're not going to detect them. And that, that, again, defining this search interval is really important for your experimental design. I mentioned detection rates. Uh, I think this is the last time I'll mention it in a talk, but maybe not but it's really important. You have to do experimental trials. There was a question about that. You have to do them separately for birds and for bats because you will find them with different frequencies. You need, basically you need dead animals to do this. And in every country, there may be different ways to get access to those dead animals. But you need, you need software, and, and we use Gen Est. I know that in Australia, there's a different software package. I think in Europe, there might be some other stuff. You need something to do this, to help you to do this, to estimate this searcher efficiency and scavenger removal. 
when, if you are able to participate in the workshop that Jill and I are doing, there will be some training in this. Um, and the last step in the process, or the last, the last topic that I want to touch on is mitigation. And this should look very similar to what my Spanish colleagues mentioned and to what Jill mentioned. It's a three-step process. You want to do everything you can to avoid killing animals. If you're going to kill animals, you want to minimize the number of animals you kill. And then if you can't minimize, then you have to compensate. You have to replace them somehow. So we've talked a little bit about some of these detection technologies. You can just use people to detect an flying animals. You won't do a very good job. Um, computer vision is much better and it can be really effective. There are several available tools. This is Identiflight. People have used radar, people have used acoustic surveys, all kinds of things are available for detection. There are also deterrence technologies. These are not particularly well developed, but uh, there are a few of them that have been tested. People have tested sort of vis visual deterrence, things to scare birds and bats. I don't think they work super well. Uh, we are, there, there's been a, there was an interesting paper out of Norway about suggesting that painting wind turbine blades could work really well. They had a sample size of four wind turbines and their data were a little bit wonky. I don't know how we translate wonky, but uh, the we are replicating this in Wyoming and we're gonna do this with 36 turbines that we're painting and we're gonna have about 72 unpainted turbines. So hopefully we have a really good assessment of this. And then people have tried acoustic deterrence for birds and bats, loud noises, essentially. Um, you can pair a detection with curtailment, or you can just curtail. For birds, people have tried seasonal deterrence, or excuse me, seasonal curtailment at Altamont in California. It's not really clear how well it works. People use informed curtailment, and that's often with that identiflight technology. I was part of a paper that showed that it worked pretty well at one place in Wyoming. And one of my very close colleagues replicated our work at another place in California and it didn't work at all. So it really depends where you are, what type of effort you put into it, that kind of thing. With bats, somebody mentioned this, but there are season and weather specific curtailment strategies that are really effective. Um, we, we talked earlier about cut-in speeds, the speeds at which the blades start spinning. The higher those are, the less risk there is to bats. Uh, so those are things we can we can change, sometimes with very small changes to power production. That was a couple of years ago. The newer turbines might be different, but there's some exciting opportunity there. And then we can compensate. We can create new animals or we can create new habitat so that people can, so that the animals can, can uh, survive there. We can do habitat improvement, which affects potentially survival and reproduction. We can do food supplementation. Again, that affects survival and reproduction. Or we can do threat reduction, power pole retrofitting, or, or removing toxicants from the environment. That primarily affects survival rather than reproduction. So just to conclude, Wind-wildlife interactions are obviously a real conservation concern. You're all here. You all believe that, I think. Prior work in the USA has showed us some things that are relevant, but from my perspective, it has had limited scientific value at times. But there are tools that exist to assess and, and reduce impacts to wildlife. And so I think there's a real opportunity in Kazakhstan as Jill said, to, to get this right from the beginning. And, and I hope that the workshop that we're doing, these discussions today are a step in, in that direction. So I think, yeah, that's it. 
this is the same last slide as Jill had, but uh, thank you very much for your time.